Hi, my name is Curtis Mares. I'm a professor of ethnic studies at UCSD. As my remarks go on, hopefully you'll be able to see how uh, I'm building upon the uh, previous videos uh, and their interesting contributions. Uh, so in 2013, I was elected uh, to serve as president of the American Studies Association, uh, which is a, a group of uh, uh, scholars, students, and activists all devoted to the study of U.S. history and culture in a global frame. Uh, and uh, in getting ready for that year as president, I had to come up with a theme for the year and, and a theme for our convention. Um, and increasingly, I was thinking about all sorts of forms of debt. And so our theme for that year was beyond the logic of debt towards an ethics of collective dissent. Um, and that theme organized a number of papers at our annual convention um, and lectures on issues around uh, uh, debt and healthcare. Uh, issues of, of uh, debt uh, and uh, the prison industrial complex, uh, questions of how debt has historically covered over forms of colonial violence or forms of, of racial violence, uh, and of course student debt. Um, and student debt increasingly uh, came to loom large um, in my own thinking about, uh, about this topic. And so when it came time to uh, put together my presidential address for 2013, um, I came up with a, an address titled Seeing in the Red, Looking at Student Debt, um, and in part uh, was focusing on visual culture that, that made student debt uh, visible to us in a, in a critical way. And so one of the things I looked at or analyzed was a clip from uh, an amazing film by Alex Rivera uh, called Sleep Dealer, which is a, a dystopian near future uh, a film set on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and the particular scene I analyzed, uh, this young tech worker, Luz, uh, comes home to her uh, dark apartment after a long day of work um, to uh, check her video messages. And she has a video message from a man in a suit, uh, a pretty fierce-seeming man who says unless she pays her student debts uh, right away, that uh, private security guards are going to come to her home uh, and steal her stuff. Um, and uh, uh, at the end, he signs off uh, in a kind of bitter joke by saying, you know, have a nice day. Um, and while that's supposedly a, a, a dystopian bit of the near future, it became clear to me that that was the dystopian present of so many, uh, of so many students. Um, and in particular, that scene suggested to me um, uh, uh, reinforced claims that other people have made uh, in previous videos uh, about uh, the work that uh, that debt does um, uh, to individualize people, uh, uh, to isolate people. Uh, and sort of separate people uh, from, uh, from collectivities. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that debt uh, individualizes and privatizes um, for at least uh, two interrelated reasons. Uh, first, it's because uh, people experience uh, an epistemological deficit or a, a lack of knowledge uh, about debt, uh, how debt works, how debt will limit uh, future options. Uh, and in, in, uh, increasingly in terms of uh, you know, knowledge about all of these hidden costs that uh, people have talked about in previous videos. Uh, but a second reason um, uh, uh, that debt individualizes and privatizes is because in the U.S. at least, uh, debt is often weighed down with uh, ideas about shame. Uh, to be in debt uh, is somehow imagined as our shortcomings, our personal uh, uh, fault, uh, our, our own irresponsibility, um, and so, uh, you know, uh, being in debt, uh, making good on your debts, paying your debts, uh, is freighted with all of this idea, or all of these uh, ideologies about moral worth, uh, and all of these ideas about shame. And so, uh, uh, people uh, are often, when they're in debt, they don't talk to other people about it. It's like their own, uh, their own sort of secret shame. And so, the sort of shame component of debt uh, is partly what uh, prevents people uh, from thinking about debt uh, uh, structurally, uh, thinking about debt uh, uh, collective, uh, collectively. Um, and so debt really is part of a, a larger kind of political project, uh, I would argue, um, that is about uh, reproducing particular kinds of subjects and subjective relationships to the world, uh, or reproducing certain kinds of orientations uh, uh, to the world. Um, and I think there's a really excellent example of this uh, from the history of the UC system. So, um, uh, and, and Ronald Reagan's administration of the UC system uh, when he was uh, governor of California in the 1960s. So, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was actually a big proponent 
of uh, uh, fee increases. Historically, the idea in the UC system was that um, uh, it was supposed to be free for residents of California as a kind of public good. Uh, and so to this day, the UC system doesn't use the language of tuition, uh, but does use the language of fees. Um, and fees have increasingly over the years gone up to, uh, you know, uh, the really high rate that they are now. Um, and uh, uh, Reagan uh, was really invested in increasing fees uh, for UC students, but not for material or economic reasons, uh, uh, largely for uh, political reasons. Um, so Reagan was very dismayed by the level of uh, protest, the free speech movement on campuses, um, and uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement on campus. And so he was infamous for using very heavy-handed police and military force uh, to put down those uh, protests. That was the sort of mode of, I guess, of hard power. At the same time, he was imagining a, a softer mode of, mode of power, which I imagine didn't feel soft uh, to the people who had to pay. Um, but the softer mode of power was imagined as increasing fees uh, with the thinking that students would be less likely uh, to protest uh, if they had to pay for their college education, uh, if they had to work uh, uh, incessantly, uh, effectively, uh, to pay for their college education. They would have less time, uh, less energy um, to devote to protest. And in fact, student fees would more tightly tie students um, to uh, uh, working to reproduce uh, the status quo. Um, and so there are ways in which uh, uh, the institution of, of higher and higher fees was imagined by Governor Reagan as part of a larger political project uh, to, uh, to effectively clamp down uh, on dissent um, and, um, and, and, and link people uh, uh, to the status quo and keep the status quo going as was. <clears throat> and so for that very reason, I think that historical lesson says to us that, uh, that debt uh, uh, is part of a larger uh, political project. And so collective organizing and activity, uh, collective social movements around debt uh, have the potential to have quite a conceptual and political uh, uh, extent and, and reach. Um, so in so many ways, um, uh, debt is at the center of uh, uh, so many issues that people face in the United States. If for no other reason than uh, most of us are in debt, uh, in some way uh, or another. And in particular, I think about the relationship between uh, health care um, and, and student debt. Um, and I think there are lessons to be learned from the current administration's uh, inability so far, or failure to, um, to repeal Obamacare uh, for our current moment in terms of thinking about student debt. So in the healthcare context, I think what, uh, what that suggests, that difficulty in being able to uh, repeal Obamacare is that uh, a number of folks in the U.S. have decided that health care is, is a right. They've gotten used to having uh, government-subsidized health care, and it becomes increasingly difficult to take something like that uh, away. Um, and I think one could do similar things or say similar things about uh, education, um, because from La Jolla, uh, where I teach, all the way to Palestine, uh, education and student debt, that is, student debt cuts uh, to the heart of the right to education. Um, and it seems to me that uh, a collective movements uh, organized around questions of student debt uh, could do uh, the important work of both articulating and actualizing that right to education. Thank you.